Hello, AP students. This is Mrs. Politsky, and I have notes for Chapter 4, Sensation and Perception. And we are going to focus today on hearing. So this is a continuation of Part 2. So follow along, and maybe you'll learn a little something. So the question is, and it's, and it's kind of an old adage, if a tree falls in the forest, and there's no one to hear it, is there a sound? And this is a kind of a question that has perplexed people for years. Matter of fact, it's perplexed uh, some of our AP students in this class. And that's something that we're gonna focus on. And as we go along, we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, characteristics of sound, uh, the steps to hearing sound waves, some of the sensory qualities of sound, and a couple of different types of hearing loss. But the, the thing to remember about this question is that sound is not a physical phenomenon. It is purely psychological, meaning that it has to be interpreted and processed by the brain. So the answer to this question is most likely no. And I, that certainly has some people a little uh, ruffled, but we'll kind of go along and we'll explain why this is. So we're gonna talk about uh, frequency and amplitude. Um, the, the thing that we need to know is that when we're producing sound, at least you know here on earth and not up in space, because in space there is no such thing as sound, regardless of what some of the sci-fi movies kind of portray. Um, we need vibrations, vibrations of energy um, that can be transferred through the air. Uh, and as they are moving through the air, they're going to be pushing molecules kind of back and forth. And if there is something there to receive it, then obviously we're going to hear a sound. And we've got to talk about the characteristics of these sounds. So we got to talk, first of all, about frequency. Uh, this is the number of cycles completed by a sound wave in a given amount of time. And normally, this is we're talking about things like cycles per second or hertz. OK, so when we talk about the frequency, typically it is measured in what we call hertz. Amplitude is the physical strength of a wave. Uh, it's measured from the top of the wave to the bottom of the wave, sometimes known as the trowel. Um, the idea is that um, we're gonna, this is all about like the loudness of that. So I'm gonna flip here and we're gonna talk about these properties of the waves. Um, waves kind of vary in wavelength the distance between these different peaks. And the frequency, that's the number of the wavelengths that can pass a given point in a given time. And it kind of depends on the wavelength. So the shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency. Uh, the longer the wavelength, the lower the frequency. So, you know, in, in a way, this kind of works the same way for color. So when we have, like, colors that are bluish, Okay, in, in hue, uh, they, temp they tend to have like a higher frequency, whereas colors like red have a lower frequency, and you can kind of see that within the wave itself. Amplitude, uh, the waves vary in amplitude, that's the height from the peak to the trowel. Um, that's going to determine the intensity of either a color or the strength of the sound. So uh, louder sounds have a greater distance between the, the peak and the trowel and sounds that are quieter or softer or colors that are duller uh, have kind of a lower distance between the peak and the trowel. So steps to hearing sound waves. And you have this information already written down so you don't have to write, but you can follow along. Uh, airborne sound waves must travel or be relayed to the inner ear. And vibrations, the, the molecules that are pushing uh, into your ear, they're gonna vibrate off the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. And as they do that, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup are all gonna move. Uh, the bones, for the most part, are going to send vibrations to the cochlea, and that is the primary organ for hearing. That is where the sensory receptor cells are going to be located. And it's at that point that we're going to have some transduction of the energy into 
basically a nerve impulse. Okay, once that happens, um, you know, that energy is going to be moving off of what is called the basilar membrane. And inside that membrane, it is inside the cochlea, uh, it's kind of fluid filled, there are these tiny hair cells that are going to vibrate. And it's that vibration that is going to trigger um, an impulse that's going to go through the auditory nerve. From there, uh, we've got that neural message, as I mentioned. And then that neural message is going to travel to the auditory cortex in the brain where it's going to register as a sound. And from that, you know, we're going to hear a little bit more about like uh, some of the sensory qualities of the sound and how that's all going to be processed by the brain. So looking at a diagram here, uh, I think you guys are all familiar with, the, you know, kind of the inner workings of the ear because we've talked about this in your intro class, but you have your outer ear that kind of works um, kind of as a, a funnel, you know, to, to move energy into the auditory canal or the ear canal, as you see here, uh, that's eventually going to hit the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. It's going to vibrate and you're going to find the hammer, the anvil, uh, and the stirrup. They're all going to move. As it moves a little further, um, you're going to hear a little bit more uh, in our next video uh, when we get into talking a little bit about um, the vestibular um, functions and, and kind of what's happening with that. But um, that kind of helps with, with balance and we'll, we'll mention that later. But uh, eventually it's going to pass to the cochlea. And the cochlea again has the basilar membrane, as you see here, and those tiny hair cells that are going to be um, moved because of the vibration and eventually send that message down the, the auditory nerve. Uh, along with that, we have the eustachian tube. Uh, this is important as far as things like swallowing, um, but it also has a lot to do with balance. And if you have ear infections, certainly that can cause some problems. So let's talk about the sensory qualities of sound. Uh, pitch, for the most part, is the quality of sound governed by the rate of vibrations um, producing it, and the degree of highness uh, will result from very quick or fast vibrations. If it's got a low pitch, it's going to be because of slower um, vibrations that are going to take place. Um, this also kind of has a little bit to do with something known as a place theory, uh, because uh, pitch, in, in turn, uh, when one hears or what one hears on a certain region of the vascular membrane, uh, if that region receives like a, the greatest amount of stimulation, it might give us a, an understanding of where uh, the sound is coming from. So that's important. Loudness, loudness for the most part is um, the attribute of the auditory sensation in terms of sound, which can be ordered on a scale extending from quiet to loud. In other words, we're talking about loudness. And to measure this, you must use decibels. Um, and you probably are familiar with the fact that uh, anything that is really about 85 and above as far as decibels can produce uh, some kind of form of hearing loss. So if you happen to go to a loud concert uh, and you're standing really close to speakers, I mean, you could be talking 140 decibels easily. Uh, thunder that's happening nearby, maybe 120. Uh, a jet plane at a very close range, over 100, uh, and so on. So you get down to talking about things like whispers and, and such. Okay, all that has a range of decibels. Finally, the, the timbre. Uh, this is basically the material composition of the voice or instrument making a sound such as the richness or the brightness of the quality of sound. Um, this term actually comes from a Greek word for drum. And, and if you think about like tympanic membrane, that's kind of where that's coming from. But it is a combination of pure tones. It is the mixture of tones that allows us to distinguish the same song being sung by different performers. Um, let's talk a little bit about hearing loss. Uh, we're going to mention a few things about um, conduction deafness and nerve de deafness, also known as sensory neuro deafness or hearing loss. Um, when we talk about conduction deafness, this is the inability to hear resulting from damage to the structure of the middle ear or inner ear. Um, there is some kind of sound awareness, but 
for the most part, it's a mechanical kind of thing, um, a mechanical system that conducts the sound waves to the cochlea. So if there is like a, you know, let's say the hammer is broken or there's damage to the eardrum, this might result in some form of deafness. And then probably the more serious is the sensory neuro deafness or nerve deafness. Um, this is the inability to hear resulting to damage to the structures of the inner ear or the sense organ. So that could be caused by damage to the receptor cells. Okay, meaning that the vascular membrane or the hair cells are damaged in some way or damage to the auditory nerve. What's interesting is individuals who have sensory neuro deafness, uh, there have been some breakthroughs as far as re being able to return um, some of the, the abilities to hear, and that is through a cochlear implant. And what this does is it converts sound into electrical signals uh, that will eventually stimulate the auditory nerve um, through electrodes. Uh, that are threaded into the cochlea. So if you, I don't know if you can see this very well, but there is like a like a series of wires that go through uh, the cochlea that kind of uh, reach back uh, to a device that eventually is is attached to the side of the temporal lobe. And because of this, this has the ability to return, uh, the gift of hearing to some people who have had hearing loss. It's kind of controversial in the the world of people who are hearing impaired, whether or not to do this or not, uh, but certainly it, it can change a person's life by having this. Thank you very much.